So uh, again, good morning, everyone. So um, thank you for joining us here. This is, I was trying to count, this is actually our third research symposium. We had a knowledge exchange forum in the middle there. So I guess it's our fourth uh, 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 expose, I guess, of, uh, of research and, uh, and uh, similar, similar projects and information. Uh, today's a bit of an experiment, I'll be honest. Um, usually when we do our research symposiums, symposia, we uh, showcase uh, the community-based research projects that we fund um, uh, through uh, the Government of Canada's Homelessness Partnering Strategy. Uh, today, uh, what we've uh, actually, uh, we've, we've been working with our research committee uh, as well as um, a small working group from that research committee to, to design this, this event. And there's been so much focus on data and we've built such capacity, not only, not only in uh, government, but also uh, in the community sector, in terms of the data that we collect around, um, around the services we provide, uh, the clients that we're serving, um, that we thought, okay, let's, let's talk about data. Let's talk about how we can use data. Um, you know, we, we often hear about uh, large businesses. Uh, we talk about business intelligence and data visualization, and you hear a lot about what Facebook and Google are doing with, with data. Um, and I, I don't think people have a clear idea of how much data we have on the services we provide and the amount of information that we could get from that, from that data uh, through analysis and most importantly through collaboration. And that's really the spirit of, of the day today. So, uh, so the morning session will be about data. Uh, the afternoon session will be uh, focused on um, community engaged research how we use research to spur action on policy and practice uh, related to homelessness. Um, so hopefully, I know a lot of you are going to be staying uh, for the whole day. Some of you will be staying in the morning, and some of you, and there will be others who are only here for the afternoon. So, uh, but thank you for taking the time today. I want to just do a quick thank thank you to uh, Government of Canada Homelessness Partnering Strategy, Government of Alberta Alberta Human Services. Um, uh, as well as uh, the Alberta Centre for Child and Family Community Research for webcasting uh, portions of today, uh, the University of Alberta's Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry for providing this space for free, uh, which is great during uh, Reading Week, of course. We don't have all the students hanging around here, um, so uh, we were free to use this space. I um, also want to thank uh, the members of our research committee uh, who uh, helped us organize this event and who uh, on, on an ongoing basis support our work at Homeward Trust and in the community uh, to get a better understanding of homelessness and uh, housing and security issues. So um, I am pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Ron Kneebone, uh, presenting Homelessness in Calgary and what we can learn from time series data. Uh, Dr. Kneebone uh, is a professor of economics and director of economic and social, social policy in the School of Public Policy, both at the University of Calgary. In his published research, he has examined the characteristics of Canadian government fiscal, health and social policy choices. For the past few years, he has been learning from others about the complex problem of homelessness and has sought to bring the perspectives of an economist to the problem. He is a co-author of two undergraduate textbooks in economics, a best-selling economics principles text with co-authors Gregory Mankiw and Ken McKenzie, and an intermediate level text with co-authors Andrew Abel, Ben Bernanke, and Dean Crushore. For joint work with Ken McKenzie, he was awarded the Doug Purvis Memorial Prize for the best published work in Canadian public policy in 2000. From 2002 to 2006, Professor Kneebone was an associate editor of Canadian Public Policy, Canada's foremost journal examining economic and social policy. So I'd like to invite Dr. Kneebone up. Oh. <laughs> and soon there will be a slideshow go up. Uh, well, thanks, Gary. Uh, and thank you for having me up. Um, yes, I'm an economist. I usually start my presentations by apologizing for being an economist. Um, so, so I guess I will again. Uh, so the bio is right. It should be because I wrote it. Um, I didn't get into homelessness research until about six years ago, 
before then I was just a regular old economist and my specialty was looking at government finances and why governments do the things that they do and the things they should stop doing. One day I got invited to a meeting if I wanted to, if anyone wanted to learn about homelessness I should come to this meeting so I went um, and I kind of got hooked and ever since I've been uh, looking at homelessness from the point of view of an economist and I know that's different from the perspective of a lot of people in this room and so you're going to see things through a different lens perhaps and now I have learned an awful lot some of the people I've learned things from are there that that's just a very short list so I'm going to just lead you through kind of my journey of discovery about homelessness and looking at homelessness through the lens of an economist and of course an economist likes to use data so the first thing I learned, it wasn't very long before I learned this, is that I didn't know very much. And that although I think I've got something useful to say, maybe you can be the judge of that as we go along, um, but nothing I can do as an economist, I can't do anything unless I receive input from people working in other areas, whether it's social work, sociologists, anthropology, um, political scientists even, um, all have something to contribute here. and and also the community has to be involved because uh, I'll give you an example later where I'm wandering around the drop-in center in Calgary with a bunch of regression results asking people to interpret that for me. Uh, <laughs> it's literally true um, and, and the, the involvement of community is key and also the involvement of government is absolutely key as well because they hold data and they also are the people who are in a position of actually doing something about the problem. And really that's the philosophy of the School of Public Policy where I work. Our goal is to try to uh, integrate the efforts of academics, the community, and the government to come up with effective policy solutions. Uh, other things I learned is that everything depends on everything else. So if you want to talk about homelessness, you better think about domestic violence, you better think about social assistance policy, you better think about poverty, you better think about food insecurity, you better think about bylaw enforcement, the legal and justice system as well. All these are in intricately involved. More of what I learned. Uh, we cannot continue to do the same things we've always done and expect something to get a different result. So I'm going to show you graphs. Yes, I'm an economist. I'm going to show you graphs showing that homelessness in Calgary is going like that. And if you don't want it to continue like that, maybe you need to start doing things differently. Uh, and in order to figure out what we need to do differently, we need to understand why it is that homelessness has gone up so quickly. And my example is going to be Calgary. But it's, it's not unique to Calgary. So. Uh, I got involved in this. I thought, okay, first thing I need is some data. And I asked around. Apparently, there wasn't any. Uh, so um, I pushed around, and finally, I, you know, I couldn't find anything. I couldn't even find out the, how many homeless people there were. Uh, and I certainly couldn't find any information about what the characteristics were. Uh, this is improving. You can now get from the uh, provincial government, you can get daily data on shelter use by shelter. Uh, in Alberta and, that, and I'm going to show you some of that today so and we've now got a lot of information in Calgary with uh, the homeless inform homeless management information system and now leads a lot uh, yields a lot of information about the characteristics of people and of course you need all of this if you're going to figure out what the problem is and how you're going to help people and I'm not telling you the news so I'm going to show you some data this is data on overnight stays uh, in in Alberta since 2008. These are monthly averages. And this kind of summarizes the power of data because as soon as you look at that, you go, holy smokes, what's going on? So the top blue line, that's Calgary. That's the number of uh, shelter, shelter stays in Calgary, uh, roughly 2,000 a night. And the red line's Edmonton, uh, currently about 1,000 a night. Why is Calgary's twice as high as Edmonton's? Well, that's the first thing I did. I said, why is that? Uh, and I didn't know. And no one seemed to know. So we started thinking about it. So then I asked another question. Why do two cities that are so similar to one another, Edmonton, Calgary? They have the same, roughly the same population, same social assistance program, same federal and provincial tax and child care policies, same minimum wage provisions, same lousy hockey teams. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, I got up in time last night to see the Oilers lose. Uh, so why is this? So why are two cities so similar to one another have such different experiences with respect to homelessness? So that led me to ask more questions. Why does Calgary have half as many rental units per thousand people as Edmonton? Maybe that's the reason. Well, why is it though? Why does Calgary have half, half as many rental units? Is it because, of me, and remember, everything's the same. The two cities are very similar to one another. Same province, same country, same everything. What's different is maybe municipal regulations. Are municipal regulations on land density and zoning laws playing a role? That's a really important question and I want to dig deep into sometime. If someone knows the answer, you can save me a lot of effort, but that's something I want to look into. Digging deeper. So that data I looked at was monthly data, uh, monthly averages, but you can also get it by day. And so that, once you look at it by day, it poses still more questions. So here it is again. This is what's going to show next is Calgary, the daily shelter stays in Calgary since 2008. Okay, so a lot of variation. The shades indicate different years, so you can just see the regression over time a little bit easier. And what does that show you? What it shows you is a lot of variation going on here. Shelter stay up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. The red line shows kind of a smooth trend that you might suggest this. Well, this is due to influences that change slowly over time, year by year. But within each year, there's a lot of variation. What's going on here? So once you have that data, you can dig a little bit deeper. So shelter use clearly varies by year, the, the red wavy line, but it's also changing by period within the, the shaded panels. You can see it also changes within years. And if you look really, really closely, you can see it changes within months. And if you look even closer at that data, it changes within weeks, day of the week. So how, what do you learn from looking at that? Well, you can look at that and you find out things like this. Shelter stays by day of the week. And this is one of the graphs I when John Rollins, uh, who's at the drop-in center of Calgary, he was giving me a tour of the drop-in center, and I was, had this graph with me, and I said, John, can you explain why this is? Why is it that on Saturdays and Fridays there's so many fewer people staying at the drop-in? He says, well, that's because you don't understand what homelessness is. I said, well, fine, educate me. He says, well, because a lot of the people in the shelter are actually working full-time. And when they get their paycheck on Friday, the first thing they do is they escape the shelter. That's what it is. I said, oh, I hadn't realized. So again, I'm learning just by carrying bits of my data around showing it to people. And you can also do it by shelter stays by month. There's a seasonal pattern here as well. Okay, it dips in June and then rises again. And I asked John about that. Why is there this seasonal pattern? He said, one of the reasons is that when spring finally comes to Calgary, there is a lot of landscaping work, and that draws a lot of casual labor to Calgary, and they often end up in shelters. And that's part of the seasonal pattern. He also suggested it would be something to do with the stampede, which I'll get to in a little bit. So what's left? Here's an equation for the other economists in the room so they can get excited and see something. Uh, but the rest, the, rest, the rest of you can just ignore it. So if, if, we account, if we account for the variations to shelter stays due to things that change slowly over time by year, and if you account for things that change by month and change by week, what's left? Well, what's left is about 28% of the rest of the variation. And it looks like that. Okay, this is what's left after I explain if there's things that are happening to homelessness due to changes by year, by month, et cetera. This is what's left. Well, what's this? Well, what's left? There's still a lot of variation here. There's some jumps up here by 100 guys a night. What's going on? Is it the weather? And this is the paper we published to the School of Public Policy. We, we asked the question, well, rough sleepers are people who would, if they could have their preference, sleep out of doors rather than in a shelter for a variety of reasons. But of course, they're not going to sleep out of doors in all weather conditions. So their movement, we would expect to see rough sleepers move into and out of shelters depending on weather conditions. And so that, we looked at this, first of all, because we were curious, and then it turns out there was a real good reason for doing it, which I'll get to. So what's going to, what's going to affect the movement of rough sleepers into shelters? Well, how cold it is and whether it's 
reverse precipitation. Duh, obvious. Okay, so the other things you could look at is check day. When social systems check come, does that affect movements into shelters? Does the stampede, this is something John suggested to me, would be the case that when Calgary stampede starts, 3,500 casual laborers come to Calgary, and he says they often end up in shelters. Uh, we had to take into account the great flood, of course. And Christmas, when Christmas comes, John told me that people often leave shelters because their families take them in. So we did a whole bunch of fancy statistical stuff. Turns out that John was wrong. The stampede has no statistical significance. Christmas does affect pull people out, uh, check days, not a big deal, a little bit of a deal. Weather. What's weather? Turns out when it gets cold, again, not surprising, but what's, what's interesting here is that you can actually identify how many, the numbers. So when it starts getting cold, when it drops from zero to minus 10 degrees Celsius, 31 rough sleepers move into shelters. When it falls again to minus 10 to minus 20, 48 rough sleepers move into a shelter to escape the cold, uh, et cetera. When it goes to minus 30, you get 134 in Calgary. 134 rough sleepers have moved into shelters. And that's fairly significant given there's a roughly 2,000 night in Calgary. Now, if you're really brave with this, you can actually take this, these calculations and, oh, sorry, hold that on a sec. Precipitation also matters. And what's interesting about precipitation is not rain so much, it's not snow so much, it's sleet. So it's a combination of rain with mild, mildly cold temperatures has a real impact. So if, in fact, we identified on April 12, 2012, and that's an important date because that's outside the area where the government often provides winter emergency response beds. It turns out they don't necessarily have it right. So on April 12, 2012 in Calgary, when the overnight temperature was not all that cold, minus two degrees Celsius, but there was 28 millimeters of rain slash sleet because it was mildly cold, 228 rough sleepers moved into doors. So it had a pretty dramatic effect, 10% of the homeless population. If you're really brave, you can actually take data on wet, average weather patterns and make a forecast of how many rough sleepers will move into shelters by day of the week, by day. And if you're brave, you can do that, and that's what it looks like. And so not so much during the warm weather, but certainly during the cold and rainy weather. And you note this spike uh, in early June, well, that's Calgary's rainy season. Okay. It usually coincides with stampede. Now, what, so what? That's kind of curious, but here's what you can actually do with it. So these are point in time counts for Calgary for the last uh, five counts. And you can see each count is uh, taken on a certain night with a certain temperature and certain precipitation. Um, so, for example, on the May 14th, this one here, the point in time count of rough sleepers said there were 569 rough sleepers. Well, of course, that's because there was a, that was, that's the count of rough sleepers, but it's conditional on the fact it was warm that night, 7.6 degrees Celsius, and there was no precipitation. But on January 18th, I was part of that count. I remember this one well. It was minus 32, and it was freakishly cold. And the count, the PIT count, said, well, there are only 90, or 64 rough sleepers. Well, of course, that wasn't right. A lot of the rough sleep people who would normally be rough sleepers had moved into indoors. And so we could use our model to calculate that with that precipitation at that temperature, there must have been 134 rough people who would normally be rough sleepers had escaped the cold and moved indoors. So how many rough sleepers were in Calgary in Jan January 2012? There were actually 198. And so we can use our statistical model to identify how many rough sleepers there actually are people who would choose that they could, if, if the weather permitted, sleep out of doors. And I think that's kind of useful. Let's take a longer view. The Calgary Drop-In Center, as you know, is the largest single shelter in North America, an average of 1,100 stays per night currently, roughly 2014. John Rollins gave me data, daily data, from 1992 in the Drop-In Center. Thank you, John. He remember he said to me, would this be useful? And I said, oh my God, are you kidding me? Thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so that allows you to ask even more questions. Uh, 
So there's the data. This, this is, uh, these are nightly stays uh, by day at the Calgary Drop-In Center since 1992. And the first thing that strikes you, of course, it started off low and now it's high. So you ask, what happened? So we started thinking about this. So from an average 100 overnight stays in 1992 to 1100 and 214, why has this happened? So I'm going to show you one explanation. Uh, the next slide shows a picture of downtown Calgary, a map of down Cal downtown Calgary showing uh, SRO, single room occupancy hotels. First of all, in 1970, there were 31 such hotels in downtown Calgary. Now there's seven, well, as of 2009. In 1970, there were two shelters. Now there are 10 shelters. So there's a graph. There's a picture of Cal downtown Calgary in 1970. The teal boxes all show the names and locations of SROs. And then in 1992, 22 years later, they're all gone. So, uh, one of the projects I had, it's nice being a professor, is you can, you can hire young people to do this slave labor for you. And I hired, hired this poor young woman to, to go through newspaper archives to identify when those uh, SROs were closed and how many beds were in them to get an idea of maybe this is an explanation of why the drop-in center's number of beds has grown over time. And of course, as an economist, I keep looking at data, but John always reminds me, he says, Ron, you know what? Data are actually people. And so he sent me these slides. These are slides of a guy named Dusty. And he's going, this is a series of pictures. He's standing in front of places where he used to live during his lifetime. So he used to live in front of the National Hotel, but it's now closed. These are all downtown Calgary. He used to live here, but, uh, but that place is now been demolished. The St. Louis Hotel he used to live there too, but that's been shut up. Uh, St. Louis again. There's the Ralph Klein's favorite place. Uh, that's also been closed. Uh, Cecil Hotel recently torn down. He used to live there. Uh, he used to live at a place called the Calgarian. It's now closed. St. Regis, closed. Uh, the Auberge Hostel, closed, demolished. A rooming house used to be there. It's now a parking lot. An apartment building has been removed. He used to live there. Uh, they used to, he used to live here. And that was torn down for a more socially preferred solution, which is a casino. I'm being sarcastic. Uh, another, he used to live here. It's, it's gone. So when you, start, when you do these sorts of things, he said, wow, why has the drop-in center grown so quickly? Well, maybe it's because we've torn down the places where poor really poor people used to live. Uh, so what uh, Jean and my student did, she, she uncovered, uh, she could identify 21 of the 31 closed SROs and identify how many rooms there used to be in them. It turns out that of those 21 that we could identify, they contain collectively 1,100 rooms. And remember how many people now say the drop-in center is about the same. So why is the drop-in center, why this number stays in drop-in center gone like this? It's because the number of SROs has gone like this. So is it the, really the case that affordable housing in Calgary is no longer affordable? Maybe that's another answer. So you can actually look at that too. This is, just takes a little bit of digging and <laughs> graduate students who are anxious to work for you. Uh, and so I had a, yet another student, I said, well, let's find some, what, what is the social assistance rate that is paid in Alberta to someone classified as a single employable? And of course, I'm, I'm talking about single employables because these are people who typically end up, they're, they're the ones who end up in shelters. And I want to compare the amount of income that we give, provide to single employables on social assistance relative to the rent that they have to pay. And we're going, I'm going to just, we looked up the average rent on a one bedroom apartment. You could use bachelors too and you're going to get the same answer. Okay, so this is an affordability index. And as you can tell, if the higher that number, the more affordable it is. My income's high relative to the rent I have to pay. If it's low, I'm in trouble because my in income's low relative to the rent. So if you collect data on that, what does that look like? It looks like this. So this is Calgary again. And along the horizontal, this 
course, this is economics. This is how economists talk to one another. I wouldn't have to say anything more if you were all economists. You'd all say, wow. But if you're not, so I'll explain. <laughs> <coughs> so as I walk, if I walk in this direction, the rental affordability index is increasing. So moving to the right is good. So my rent's more and more affordable, and my income's rise high relative to rent I had to pay. On the vertical axis, the number of shelter stays in the drop-in center. And, I've circ and this is by year, and I've circled 1992, the first year. You see down there, in 1992 in Calgary, rents were pretty affordable. And the number of people st staying in the drop-in center was pretty low. Uh, 0.2 people per thousand Calgarians. Over time, you can see the march of time, boom, 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 up, up, sliding up that line. With the march of time, rent has become less and less and less affordable, and the number of stays in the, in the drop in the center has gone up and up and up and up. And some squiggling going on at the top since about 2010. I want to investigate it a little bit more, but I suspect that's because of the efforts of the Calgary Homeless Foundation and their 10-year plan. I think they're actually getting some traction. But before then, it was just a straight line. Well, almost straight. It's a little bit curvy. But, and the economists are looking at that number called an R square and they're getting all excited. That's, the, that's a measure of excitement for economists. And if, <laughs> if, if, you, if you can get it close to one, and that's awfully close to one, then they're pretty darn pleased. So this suggests that there's a very strong relationship between rent affordability and stays in shelters. Now why is that important? Well, because it starts to talk about some policy solutions. Well, what should we do then? Well, we should make rent more affordable. How do you do that? You can increase social assistance payments, pay to those who are called single employables. And if you can stick around in the afternoon, I'll show you some more evidence of that in my other presentation. You could also provide rent subsidies. Or we do, Alberta does do some rent subsidies. We could increase the size of rent subsidies. We could actually think about, what, which is my actual answer, is provide a guaranteed annual income. Because a lot of the source of poverty is not so much low income as variability in income, the uncertainty of income. A guaranteed annual income would take away that uncertainty. And I'd also think we should be thinking about incenting the private sector to be part of the solution. How do you do that? Well, you provide tax incentives. I know these are not sexy or interesting things to talk about, but they really work. Tax incentives to the private sector to build more affordable housing. You also incent the private sector to build more affordable housing but by providing income to those who want to buy low-end housing so they can afford to buy it. And if they can afford to buy it, the private sector will build it. So now we have to figure out how sensitive are shelter states to rental affordability, and that's something I want to talk about this afternoon if you're brave enough to stick around. Still more questions. I, all I've got is questions. What's been the role of deinstitutionalization? Uh, remember, I've got data back to 1992. How much of this is due to people uh, leaving, being pushed out of psychiatric hospitals and onto the street? Uh, we're, doing, we're part of a project at the drop-in center right now measure, uh, identifying the mental health issues of clients at the drop-in center to get some idea of that. Eventually, I want to make the case for the Alberta Health Services, if anybody's in the room, to step up to the plate and start looking after these mentally challenged people in ways better than putting them in a homeless shelter. Uh, other questions, What's, how has the population of so-called transitional, episodic, and chronic use shelter users changed over time? These definitions, you might be aware of them. Uh, transitional user is someone who uses shelter very infrequently. Uh, episodic uses it relatively infrequently. And a chronic shelter users are people who use the shelter chronically. They, they tend to stay a long time. Each group has a different policy response. You don't help uh, transitionals with the same policies that you help chronics with. And we need to know what those, what the, how, those character, how the different categories of people in, sh in shelters have changed over time. We really need to start looking at that. What you've been hoping for, concluding. <laughs> uh, there is so much to know. 
before we can do anything. Uh, good data is essential, and I feel like, at least from my perspective, I've only started to scratch the surface of what we can learn from data. And I think there's a whole lot work, more work to do. Uh, I'll talk about some of the additional work we're doing at the School of Public Policy this afternoon, but for now, thanks for listening. Token of appreciation. Thank you, Dr. Nebone. So we have um, actually quite a bit of time for questions. I'm sure, that, I mean, with all of, uh, all, all of Ron's questions, I'm sure that spurs some questions in the audience. So let's, uh, let's do that. Do we have a mic to go around? Or, you know what, what I'll do is if you can, if you yell out your question. Oh, there is a mic. Yes, perfect. And I've got my pen for answers too. So. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So you can either have a seat or you can get the podium up to you. There, question. Uh, you mentioned that we're starting to get uh, good information on client characteristics. Have you noticed any interaction effects in your results depending on the characteristics of the client or is it still early days for that? Uh, yeah. From what I've seen, it's very early days. Um, uh, and as far as I can, as far as I know, we're not even sh we know very little about the characteristics of those we would classify as chronic. And again, that's part of a current ongoing research project um, is to f identify what their issues are, um, whether or not how badly those issues deteriorated because they were living in shelters. I think that's an important question. Um, so I think there's still a lot of learning to do. Going back to that earlier slide you had comparing the, um, you know, shelter stays comparing Edmonton and Calgary, I was wondering what the actual numbers of beds are, if there's a huge discrepancy between you know, if that number is relevant to the actual number of beds that are available, or if we have very similar um, numbers of shelter beds available and that those numbers are just so different? I think th they'd be one and the same. Uh, I think almost all shelters are at capacity, so the number stays and is equal to the number of beds, or at least pretty closely. Seth, so, would you agree? Or um, the the actual number of beds, uh, there's, there's uh, quite a difference. I believe it's around 850 in Edmonton and something like that. 850 to 1,000 in Edmonton and about 2,000. But, but yeah. you're right, in terms of occupancy, it's... It's about 100%. Yeah. So yeah. that these, those data would measure not only the number of stays, but also the number of beds. Given my interest in Aboriginal women, do you have statistics on how many men and women are the average monthly shelters? Uh, we have information on aboriginals. I don't know if it's been broken into gender. Must have. <laughs> Must have. Okay. Um, um, so an earlier study I was involved with, I'm not showing here, uh, it was called Who Are the Homeless in Calgary. Um, if I could pull that paper off, I could probably tell the answer. I think it must be. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't have it with me. I don't, well, um, if I could talk about the homeless population in general, it's all like 90% male. Uh, I just, I don't know if it's true for Aboriginal population. I, was, I would guess it's heavily weighted towards men. Um, the, uh, the question I have is around, uh, I'm wondering if you are aware of research around the size of shelters uh, and the difference that the size and composition of a shelter and how they do things would make a difference in their ability to help transition people, in increasing safety for people as well? No, I don't, but that's a great question. Um, uh, um, are there... I mean, again, diff different shelters, um, again, I'm telling you news, but they, they special, 
<laughs> specialize in different things. So uh, whether it's a wet or a dry shelter matters, and the, the size of shelter certainly matters too. And I think that's a really important, that gets to one of, another important issue, I think, is whether you have scatter site versus um, whatever the opposite of scattered site housing is, concentrated housing, I guess, uh, which is the preferred model, uh, which is an important question. I know of no data, but doesn't mean there hasn't been any studies on that. Uh, over here. Hi. Um, at the hospital, we noticed similar fluctuations in terms of the number of people who have homelessness issues who present at the hospital, the emergency department, for example. And so I'm just wondering, in your earlier model, how much um, the variance did the weather explain, just the weather part? Um, so you, you, uh, you mentioned oh. that Christmas explained 8% of the yeah. variance in shelter um, stays. So weather, um, it, it doesn't do a lot, uh, but it, uh, so those numbers, if you take a look at the scale, that's uh, maybe a hundred, in the winter time, maybe a hundred people who would otherwise want to be a rough sleeper have moved into a shelter. So that's you know, roughly 5% of the homeless population in Calgary. So it's fairly, it's fairly significant. And I, I, the significance is probably more for a shelter operator is that you can't plan for it because you never know what the weather's going to be like. Uh, so you can't all of a sudden, if an extra five, or on that one night of April, whenever it was, when 228 came in, that was 10% of the homeless population in Calgary. An unexpected influx uh, of that size into the shelter system has got to be a big shock. Thank you. Um, just on the emergency departments, the only other study I've ever seen about the effect of weather on rough sleepers moving into shelter is two emergency departments and it was a British study that showed the, the movements into from rough sleeping into an emergency room in order to find shelter. But that's the only other study I've ever seen. Hi Dr. Nibon, over here. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, Samantha is one of my former slaves. Yes, so. he was my uh, advisor for my <laughs> capstone, which is so funny. Um, I was just curious for one, if this data um, is going to be available, are you going to publish this or put this online? Um, the, which, which data, the one from the, the drop-in? Specifically the, uh, just the weather-induced shelter states, because I think that could be of quite a bit of use to the organization that it's, I work for. It's published, go to the School of Public Policy. Oh, perfect. Um, also, I just wanted to speak to Muff, Mufti's question. Um, so I work at the Mustard Seed Calgary. I just wanted to answer your question from what we see in terms of numbers. 40% um, of our shelter stayers are of Aboriginal descent um, and anywhere between 85 to 90% of our shelter stayers are male in a night. Uh, so we have 370 beds and only a very small number are for females, but 40% of our female guests are of Aboriginal descent as well, on average. See, she talks like an economist. See all that 40 percent of this? <laughs> um, you were saying about how Edmonton has a lower rate for homelessness to Calgary. How come Calgary cannot make more homeless shelters to provide for the homeless there? Oh, these, so these are people staying in shelters. Yeah. So Calgary has provided uh, shelter sufficient okay. to house these people. Um, uh, so the interesting question though is why is this happening? Why, has Calgary, why have social agencies in Calgary found it necessary to provide all these shelter beds? And I think one of the answers is because we destroyed all the housing where really poor people used to live. I mean, it's, it's, when people look at the graph showing homelessness in Calgary zooming up, that one, they shouldn't be thinking all of a sudden Calgary's got a whole lot more poorer people than they had before. No, I think they've always been in Calgary, it's just they used to have a place to live. And interesting, that's also the history if you read, um, uh, uh, if you're looking for more economic stuff to read, uh, a, a lovely book by a guy named, an economist named Brendan O'Flaherty uh, called Make, Making Home or something like that. 
Uh, he's an economist from Columbia University, and he's been studying homelessness at New York, in New York City. And he identified that homelessness did not exist in New York City until around 1978. And so he asked the question, well, what happened? Same, I'm stealing his stuff. So he said, what happened? And one of the things he talked about is that the really poor people used to live in the Bowery in, in Manhattan, but it was all gentrified and now they end up in homeless shelters. So it's a common story, uh, destroying the homes of really poor people, they end up in shelters. Uh, you were saying about the uh, reference to check days that people don't, like it doesn't affect uh, the shelter numbers? Sorry, say it again. Uh, the shelter numbers in, uh, uh, for check days in that one, the check spot, you're saying it doesn't affect it, right? Not much, a little. It's, it's what we call statistically significant. But so if, you haven't, if you haven't been here during Mardi Gras, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it there with the, when the checks come, the day before the line up that one all. Right? And then the, on the, when the checks are there, for three days later, you have to be a spring attack on April 1st. Right? right. And that's the way it is. And with the shelter starts, you're then, when they do fill up, yeah. it looks like they open up the old three masks. So, I mean, that's a, that's a nice example of um, why it's really important to involve everyone in this discussion. Uh, I'll give you just another example of that. Uh, I, I, we had done some research suggesting that depending on the shelter in Calgary, whether it's the Salvation Army, the Mustard Seed, or the Drop-In Center, the effect of weather was different by the shelter. And we were a little bit puzzled by this, looking at our statistical results, trying to figure out why is that. And we went for lunch, and one of the guys at our table was a, a, a homeless guy at one of the shelters. And he said, well, it's obvious. I said, well, OK, explain to me. And he said, well, each shelter has a different set of rules about when you can, how late you can sleep. And so he said, in the Salvation Army in Calgary, they actually let you sleep till 8 a.m. Other shelters let you sleep only till 6 a.m. and then you have to be, leave. He said, so when it gets really, really, really cold, people head towards the Salvation Army. And I said, oh, thank you very much. So again, so if we were to do the weather analysis by shelter, we'd want to take into account what he suggests to us. You need to be aware of the shelter's rules in order to get a good identification too. So, and you, you offered a nice, another nice example. Right. And uh, just for people who uh, didn't hear the, the question, um, so uh, the question was, um, uh, well, basically, you know, when you, when you go to the shelters and uh, you look at the difference, just sort of anecdotally, when you look at the difference in, in lineup on check days and non-check days, um, it's quite evident that there is a pretty significant impact there, but uh, um, just the question was about uh, how that didn't show up in the data. So. Um, we're going to go to that side and then come back. Just uh, a question on demographics. I'm working with a senior serving organization and last year the social worker said, gee, we started to notice an awful lot more seniors coming in with the presenting problem being homeless. I'm wondering, have you, are you breaking that down? Have you noticed any difference in that? Uh? Yes. So the other paper which you can get from the School of Public Policy's website called Who Are the Homeless? Uh, one of the tables talks about the aging of the chronic clients. Or they're getting older over time, and which is a sad story too. Hi. Um, in your talk, you mentioned about some possible policies. Um, policies that could be implemented either through government or through the private sector. So do you know of any area outside of Calgary where such a policy has been implemented and how effective has it been? Um, so question, have I, do I know of these policy suggestions I'm offering, are they effective? Um, one way to answer that is to look, do what you're suggesting, go to other jurisdictions where they maybe have higher social assistance incomes or something. Uh, I've kind of done that, and if you stick around for the afternoon, I'll show you those results. So in, if you look across Canada, so what I'll show you this afternoon, 
if you keep, let me keep talking, I'll do it right now. Uh, if you look across <laughs> Canada, the affordability is very different in Montreal than it is in Calgary, for example. And their social assistance payments are different in different provinces. And I, we take advantage of that variation to try and get the answer you're asking. And the answer is, yes, I think this works. If you provide additional income to the very poor, they will be less likely to end up in shelters, which is not terribly surprising when you put it like that. But one of the nice things I can do is I, I can actually measure how many people would move out of shelters if we give them a certain amount of additional income. And I want to take this to the government and say, Here's, this is a good investment. By providing this much additional income, you can save an awful lot of money because these people will no longer be staying in shelters. So if you stick around for the afternoon, I can talk about that better. Okay, uh, we'll go down to Jeanette and then to Just Kyra and then to Kyle. Okay, so I'd like to go back to the previous slide that you had up about the number of shelter beds. And I don't want to be a stickler, but I'm just going to be an arch conservative, which is totally outside of my realm. I know I'm going to take on a different persona just for a minute. No, not that. It's the other one you had about the number of uh, that one. Yeah. OK, so if you notice the jump between 2001 and 2002, and then it goes really high up. Yep. Now, uh, that point in the graph correlates uh, directly with the fact that the drop-in center opened in 2002, uh, creating the largest drop-in sh shelter, uh, homeless shelter in North America. Thanks. So some people would say, well, you know, if you, if you build it, they will come. And, and this graph seems to suggest that if you build it, they will come. So I just wanted to throw that out, and I'm sure that you have a good explanation, but... <laughs> Pressure's on now. <laughs> So usually, Jeanette and I, I'm the right-wing kind of guy, and she's the left-wing, so this is different role-playing. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm suggesting here, uh, and again, I'll touch more in the afternoon, is that uh, social agencies and governments in cities are put under pressure to provide shelter beds for a variety of reasons. I'll talk about this afternoon. And so the fact that the drop-in center had to expand dramatically in 2001, that's the jump right up there, is an indication to me that something happened in Calgary to boost the uh, population of homeless people. And so the drop-in center had to respond. The shelter operators respond to demand. So when people start pushing up against the doors, then they provide they go to the government and ask for an expansion of their beds. So this is a reflection of need. So I don't, it's a good question. I, I'm happy to go back and talk to John Rollins at the drop-in center and say, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Did you provide the beds and then they were filled? Or was there this huge lineup, consistently long lineup outside the drop-in center forcing you to provide more beds? I'm, I'd be willing to bet a lot of money it was a second and he responded to demand. But that's a, that's a good question, I should pursue it. So that actually kind of leads into my question. You've talked about the data of how many shelter, youth, shelter stays there are per night. Is there anybody that's tracked the data of the number of people being turned away or that are unable to access the shelter every day? Uh, great question. Does anybody know? Because I don't. Does anyone? As an organization, I know in Calgary at the Mustard Seed, we track every night when we have to turn people away from our buses and from our, um, from our front doors. And I, I would agree that it does definitely uh, correlate with the weather as well as precipitation. So we do find that in the winter months, we're turning more people away from the shelters than, um, say, in August or July. So it, it would be really nice to have that information, uh, as well as how many did you provide beds for that night, how many did you, did you turn away? That would be really good to know. And it would help answer Jeanette's question, which is, which came first? Was it the demand for beds, or did I provide beds and people appeared? Sir, before we go to the next question, just uh, regarding shelter numbers, I'm going to pass it on to our friends at the province. So you've got to love this answer. No, we don't collect 
turn away from uh, emergency shelters on a, on a regular basis. So we don't have that in a consistent enough fashion that we could look across the province or across a particular yeah. centre. Um, we do for women's emergency shelters and family violence situations, but we have not nailed that down uh, provincially. The good thing about it is part of what we're hoping to come away from this with is are we collecting the right data and, and are we in need of changing what we might be collecting and we're finding at the emergency shelter we're, we're collecting through the provincial um, HMIS is, is likely not. It's not the right set of questions. So hopefully we can have some discussion on that as we go along through the day. Okay, up to Kyle. Hello. Thank you for doing that. That was cool. Oh, Thank you for doing that. <laughs> um, do the homeless use drugs? And in, in fact they do, does that play a role in everything? And how do you think maybe in your further research that that would be usefully datafied to find out like maybe who's using, um, like how do you imagine the future to incorporate drug use? And drug health services, addictions, services, all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, I, that's, that's a great question. Um, do, ho do homeless use drugs? Yes, just like everybody else does. Uh, a lot of people use drugs. It's all, certainly true of homeless people as well. Um, so again, uh, that's, uh, but the, you know, the majority of people who stay at shelters are not like that. They tend to be the transitional episodic users who use it really relatively infrequently. Uh, have, has drug addiction been part of the explanation for the rise of homelessness? Great question. Uh, um, Brendan O'Flaherty looking at the New York City data, he asked, the fault, he asked that question. So he tried to identify, and I want to pursue that with the Calgary Police Service who have been fantastically cooperative with us. Identi can you tell me when certain drugs became popular in Calgary, and could I correlate that with any of those blips? Now, O'Flaherty couldn't do it in New York City. He, he said, you know, when certain drugs became popular, he could not uh, correlate that with jumps in homelessness in, in New York City. So he wasn't sure if really drugs is a big driver of this. Uh, but that's another really good research question. Great. Um, because, uh, we're going to go with a couple more questions, so I'm going to go with only people who haven't asked questions yet. We've had a lot of opportunities today. So, um, I'm wondering with the difference in industry between Calgary and Edmonton, with Edmonton so, sort of being the gateway to the north and having a lot of transient workers and this being the hub for that, um, would I would assume that that would impact on how many rental units would be available because there would theoretically be more of a demand in Edmonton. Um, but also with the, um, the second part, I guess, is with the difference in economy, does that affect the, I guess, client profile of individuals using shelters in chronic, episodic, and transitional? Um, more great questions. So uh, I know I was part of a study that for Calgary, I mean, most, a lot of you will know the study done in, for Toronto, Ottawa, and Guelph that looked, identified clients as being transitional, episodic, or the other one. Uh, I was part of a study that did that for Calgary. I don't know if anyone's done it for Edmonton. Uh, it'd be good. If we someone, want to. If someone would do that, that'd be good. Next report back next week, that'd be good. Uh, um, but that would get at some of the questions too. Um, there are other diff interesting differences between the two cities. Um, lots of <laughs> interesting differences between two cities. But one of the things that's interesting about Calgary is that an uh, economic boom in Calgary actually causes homeless stays to go up because Calgary's a bit of a magnet for job seekers and with no place to live, they end up in, sh in shelters. So the current downturn that's being experienced in Calgary will cause op shelter operators to see fewer shelter stays. Uh, and I'm willing to bet big money on that, that right now the number of stays in Calgary shelters is actually plummeting, and it's due to the business cycle. Uh, we haven't seen that kind of evidence, the sensitivity to the business cycle in Edmonton, but certainly it's very strong in Calgary. So last I, question. I also like your explanation about uh, providing uh, uh, 
uh, motel spaces for oil service workers is a really good explanation of why there may be more rental units in Edmonton. That's a, that's a great point. So last question. I know that there are a lot of other questions out there and just keep in mind that that's why we have our breakout sessions later this morning. So you'll have lots of time to pick uh, Dr. Nieboden's brain. So we'll end. Last question, Maria. Okay. <clears throat> lots of pressure. <laughs> um, I actually, I, I wanted to ask a, a clarifying question about the um, rent affordability graph you had. Um, because you were talking about the single occupancy room rooms, I was wondering when you were doing the rent affordability graph, were you accounting for um, the single occupancy rooms or just actual leases and um, apartments? Ah, oh, so, so the data rental affordability is mm -hmm. just the it comes from CMHC. Uh, it's just the average rent on a one bedroom in Calgary. Okay, so now, the months monthly. Okay. Yeah. Now the problem with that data is it's an average rent, mm. and so it takes the average. So a rent on a one-bedroom apartment is like this wide in Calgary, and the average is the average. But people who are most most at risk of homelessness are probably down at this end. Okay. Uh, so I don't have data. It would be nice to have that too if, if CMHC could get busy on it to tell me <laughs> the the rent on the low end would be good to know. But what, what we've done, we've, we've played with, and I think it's in that graph, I'm not sure, we took the average, but we took like 70% of the average and said, well, that would be the rent on a low end apartment. Uh -huh. So you can do that. That's pretty rough and ready, but. Oh, I, I found it very fascinating, your um, comparison of how many single occupancy um, establishments closed down at the same time as so many drop-ins were opening. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, again, with the chicken or the egg, maybe it might be a little bit easier to tell with, with this sort of data. Could it be that um, because so many drop-ins and shelters were opening, the, the other establishments could not compete because you had to pay them? Or did the one, like, the, they close and then the shelters had to open? Great question. And again, what I really want to do is, and I can't remember which way I want to go, but the, the showing the drop-in data the, over from 1992 to now, I would like to be able, and we found it, so my student found the dates of when those hotels were closed. And I'd like to see, oh, does that correlate with that blip? Uh, so that's a great question. That's something we want, want to do. Thank you so much. Great. Like I said, lots of questions. I know there's many more questions left. So I want to just uh, thank Dr. Kneebone for taking the time to share with us his data. And, <laughs> and as, as he's mentioned, um, he will be back this afternoon uh, to tell us more about uh, what he's learned and actually to share some uh, work that he's, that he's doing right now. So um, why don't we take a quick uh, 15, 10 to 15 minute break. If everyone could be back in the hall before 10 o'clock, we'll start with the panel presentations.